But make no mistake that you have some very wealthy people living around Stonehenge. The Rothschilds have an estate. I'm sure you've heard of the Rothschilds. They're a massive, massive estate. And they've built just recently this massive pyramid on the most powerful lay there. Uh, and they're saying, oh, it's just our little greenhouse. You know, it's, it's a greenhouse. But it's, it's all done to, to sacred uh, ge geometry. But they do not drink the water you do. Yeah, they drink the deep, deep, deep yin water, okay? And they don't care how much that costs, yeah? It hasn't got any chemicals in, it's pure. And there's a beautiful old rite that if you're an esoteric water diviner and you're going for this type of water, it's considered a sacred act. Okay? And when you when you do well bore this for, you know, uh, I do know that, they, that, like I said, the Rothschilds are on this water and the, the royal family are alike in England. But you see, the, the, war, the boar head is going down very deep into the earth and all the gunk comes up like chalk and muck. But you're supposed to gather in the very thinnest of glass the first sample of the water born of Gaia. So you scoop your cup down like that, put it to the sun, and it glints like a diamond light everywhere yeah it, because it's been in the in the womb of Gaia but you get geologists would say oh that's just rubbish you know that's in, that's stupid but make no mistake there's going to be water on all planetary bodies okay in the solar system Gaia creates uranium plutonium why not water anyway and these uh, ancient sites that are sited upon them, and I really do think your ancient ancestors of Ohio Valley mirrored the outer horseshoe shape. Now that site is 26 acres, it's long gone, it got plowed out by the railways coming across America. But these uh, ancient sites do mirror what the Celts were doing back in uh, across Europe and across the pond. So some of your uh, ancient sites are, were very, very uh, holy places, for, for instance. And I think the Ohio Valley is marking a lot of uh, sacred water that's then connected to the ley lines we'll have a look at uh, in a moment. So this water, if you, if you drink it or just interact with its energy field, that geospiral, what are we? What are we contained of? Water. I love the way you say it, water. <laughs> it's, it's water. <laughs> water, darling. Um, no, I love it. I, I really do. Well, we, we are. We are literally people that contain water, and water has memory, doesn't it? So, if we say our brains hold on to memory of maybe a past thing that's hurt us in the past, or, or whatever, past life even, uh, and our brains hold on to that, well, what about our body water? And what if our body water is holding on to memory? How can we cleanse that? Yeah? And replenish and regenerate our physical bodies. Yeah? That's what the geospiral can do. It can recode your body water. Yeah, I'm really jet lagged at the moment. I've honestly had no sleep, so I'm probably not saying I'm the best candidate now of regeneration going on. But in my better days when I've had a night's sleep, uh, for example, you do feel when you work with these energies of Gaia, you can regenerate and recode your body water. Yeah. So, so what I do as well with, with children, when I take them to Avebury or Stonehenge or places, I say, we can have quiet time. We can have a little bit of quiet time. And now we're going to focus on the light of the water. Remember when I said it glints up? The light is phenomenal. And if you focus on the light within the water, yeah, and bring that up uh, your own body waters, you can cleanse and regenerate. 
Okay, and I think the more that we get older, yeah, and I'm, I'm in my, I'm 55, 56 soon, I think that, you know, you're either going to go down the Botox route or something, or you, you can literally work in harmony with Gaia, okay, to regenerate us, get rid of those old memories. Can you see the potential of an ancient site? Yeah, it has more than one thing going on at any one time. And when we look to the mysteries of Stonehenge, oh, the slide's not turning actually. I'll try this way to get it. No, it's not turning actually. No, it's stuck. I think this, the presentation's got stuck. But anyway, as we're gonna uh, try and uh, sort that out in a moment so I can go on to uh, my uh, next slide. When we look at how an ancient site, a real power place, is sited, then it's sited on more than one thing. Stonehenge is sited on all of that deep yin water, on an aquifer that is so, so deep and so, so big, it can literally, you know, affect lots and lots of people at any one time. Stanton Drew, Avebury, that uh, contain that area of thousands of people. I think our ancient ancestors weren't in the me culture. Yeah, because when I take people around to ancient sites, it's always a wonder. It is a real wonder how people uh, react. They say, for me, this was my experience. For me, uh, this happened. And that's, that's a wonderful. But I think they built these massive ancient sites for the we, yeah? And could you imagine switching on in the same mindset, 2,500 people at any one time, yeah? The potential to change people's mindsets is absolutely uh, incredible. So that's what I think these sites were for. They were to literally recode your body water, your DNA, and to switch you on to other ways of living and sharing. Is there any chance of, uh, oh, it, it's, yeah, it's flipping over now. That's brilliant. So this is Stonehenge. This is the primary halo. Every single megalithic and earthen feature in Stonehenge is sited on the yin waters from which flow all of these underground streams creating sacred sections and sacred stones within the monument itself. So Gaia, People are often saying Gaia, Earth energy, and things like that. Then, then that's true, but Gaia is fluidic. She has more surface water than land. She has more underground water than uh, solid mineral. And we reflect that. And the moon has a way of really activating these ancient inner waters, okay? We're used to seeing the new and full moon as being the power points of working with energies, aren't we? Because we see it's a physical thing, we see the crest. But to the ancient ancestors, the peak times of the influence of surface water, you know, tides and things like that of the seas, are affected by the new and full moon, but not un underground water. Underground water behaves differently than research over the past 40 years has claimed, and I think it's very accurate. So if we imagine the geospiral pattern is rotating and rotating and rotating, creating a vortex of, of energy, then for you guys living in most of America, seven days after a new or full moon, yeah, it's six days where I live in my latitude, then the rotation of the geospiral changes. Yeah, and it's very, very strong. And it's doing that month after month, cycle after cycle. And it's not just ancient sites where you find these spiral patterns. They interlace the planet. So if you find one locally, for example, then you can work with those type of energies. And like I said, I'm a, I'm a druid. And it's always been in druid law that you only pick a holiest of holiest herbs called mistletoe six days after a new or full moon. And that's when those rotations occur because nature knows what's good for it. <laughs> We've kind of lost that in a disconnect. But the, the kind of animals and the ancient people kind of knew what was going on. And they would live in harmony with this. And that's why it was recorded by Caesar in pattern that the ancient druids would only pick their mistletoe then. You start to pick 
crops at particular times of uh, the lunar month, and they have more nutrients in it, has been proved anyway. So we, we can see that all, uh, all, all the time at these ancient sites, there's different things going on. I want to introduce you to Avebury Henge. Who's been to Avebury Henge? Wow, I'm impressed, contact. Yeah, I'm, I'm really, really impressed because quite a few people haven't heard of Avebury Henge. It's massive, yeah? It covers 26 acres. It's absolutely huge. Back in the day, because in the uh, Wiltshire environs, there's chalk. Can you see that chalk path where people have cut it out? Imagine a white circle of chalk. Yep. That's what's uh, surrounded Stonehenge. That's what surrounds Avebury. Inside of which you have a stone circle here of 30 standing stones and another stone circle over here. So can you see there's an outer stone circle of 100 standing stones? Could you see what I mean? It would have gone around there. A lot of it has been broken up. Inside of which, two massive stone circles. That's called the Northern Stone Circle and the Southern Temple of the Moon, Temple of the Sun, okay? Surrounded, like I said, with this. But back in the day, Four and a half thousand years ago, orthodox dating, if you were at Avebury, you'd have gone through this massive chalk structure, yeah, polished, highly polished, reflecting the sun and the moonlight. And at Avebury, these were silver-colored stones, yeah? One is so highly polished that if you put your face by it, it's like velvet, yeah? And some of them are so finished off that they sparkle, you look at Stonehenge and it looks grey and rather dull, okay, because it's had four and a half thousand years of the British weather, come on, you know, you're not going to be at your best after that, are you? You're really not. But you see, what a lost truth about Stonehenge is, is her beauty. So you would have walked into Stonehenge through a 15-foot bank. You can't see in front of Stonehenge now. All you can see is the top of the larger stones. So you would have walked in through this massive chalk structure, and then you would have uh, looked at the silver stones that surround and have all the lintels on top, like the Stonehenge we're familiar with, silver glinting its crystallized structure in the sun. Then you would have moved forward and you would have uh, come into contact with the blue stones from Wales, highly polished. Then you would have walked through to a massive 16-foot standing stone, green-colored, flexed in red garnet. That's the Stonehenge that our ancestors created. And likewise, at Avebury uh, Henge, you had these highly polished stones. We always talk about, you know, ley lines are going through uh, ancient sites, and it's all about grid lines and ley lines. But back in the 1980s, two master dowsers that I knew very well, one passed over uh, of late, uh, called Hamish Miller and Paul Broadhurst, they were told by a top uh, English geomant, that's somebody that's into earth energies and earth mysteries and things, look guys, go and douse this ley line and see what you get. And what they really uh, understood to be the case was a lay system is more powerful than a lay line. So a lay system is if you imagine a straight line going through the landscape that has earth currents entwining it. Do you know the symbol of the caduceus? Yeah? Now imagine that's a lay system. You've got the ley line, yeah? And you've got the serpent currents, yeah? That's a lay system. And when you're with a lay system, those yin and yang currents are the power in the land. The lay transmutes its energy. Do you see what I mean? It's the living serpentine currents that are the real power in the land. You'll have a, an environment like Avebury, for example, or Stonehenge, has numerous sites associated with it. It's not just by itself. So at Avebury, you have West Kennet, Long Barrow, Silbury Hill, and numerous ancient sites. The lay will just go through Avebury and collect it to another site. Do you follow? But the earth currents meander and touch all of the ancient sites in a, in a kind of megalithic dance around the landscape and a beautiful ballet. So that's the kind of things that the English uh, and European researchers are looking into, the 
earth currents that entwine the lays because they're very, very powerful. In fact, in ancient China, as any Chinese geomount would tell you, energy, qi as they called it, travels too fast in a straight line. It's too powerful. You shouldn't be living above it. And in ancient China, if you cut through uh, a, a ley line, you know, it, they were, would say calamity would come. You can't cut these energy systems off. But they would look for white tiger, green dragon, the meandering currents, and set their sights upon it, okay? Now, the Christians recognized this as well. So when Hamish Miller was looking at the lay that goes through Avebury Hen, and Glastonbury Tor and Ayers Rock, if you put it around the world, and they noticed that every five kilometers on one of the earth currents was a church dedicated to Mary, and on the other current dedicated to Michael or George, a dragon slayer. So they called the earth currents Mary and Michael. Now, when you put a standing stone, like an acupuncture needle, onto underground yin water or an earth current, uh, and to a certain degree, a lay, the stone behaves in a particular manner, okay? It's very methodical, and the ancients knew this, that stones behave in a particular way to generate energy, okay? Energy that can affect you and others, the fertility of the land, and, and more besides. So when we think about standing stones and ancient sites, we have to think of them being very rooted into earth energy, okay? That's what the, uh, especially the long-skulled people were looking for. And this is some old research of mine that I just thought I'd share with you before uh, we move on, because it does prove a point, okay? Because when we look at the uh, standing stone here, we see, for example, that you have literally five bands above ground and two below because the stone's rooted into the ground, okay? And they absorb the earth energy in its like crystal lattice uh, structure and then they convert the energy to an aerial type of energy. Okay, flowing across the landscape. And it's truly uh, amazing when that happens. And you can feel this with your hands and you can literally feel it with your, your body. So I invited some experts in detecting electromagnetic uh, equipment to, uh, to come along with me to measure this band here. Because in a moment, we we'll see this it connects all stones in a stone circle, whereas this band here, band number four, connects sites further afield. And uh, he got his equipment, and just where I doused the energy bands, massive signals of electromagnetic energy coming out that is indisputable and undeniable. And the researcher, Rodney Hale, pointed out to me, that's at 18 hertz. We hear at 20. What if our ancient ancestors heard the stones as well as see the stones? Do you see what I mean? So I think their perception was very, very different when it comes to these energy bands. Now, there's another English researcher here with this rainbow-colored uh, site. This is called Wayland Smithies site. It's a Neolithic long-skulled long barrow. And you can see that there's lots of color here, but none there, okay? And that's because I predicted to him, this stone's rooted into the Earth energy system. It's going to give off energy. And it's the colors of the chakras coming up through. And I think the seven points, one, two beneath, and these five points above ground represent megalithic chakras, okay? So what happens when I put my hands or my, or my face or whatever against these energy bands? Well, what was noticed very strongly is that my, my whole body would become full of electromagnetic energy, yeah? And it was people like my late father who said, you don't need an hour therapy at Avebury or Stonehenge. Three minutes would do it. Yeah, that's all, three minutes. So three minutes of putting your hands on, say, band number three or, or band number two, the energy enters your body, but the magical thing is, 
four days later, it's still building up in your body, expanding your aura and balancing out your physical body is an in truly incredible thing, okay? So megalithic energy is very, very powerful. And this is what, you know, people don't want you interacting with at Stonehenge. They don't want you interacting with that uh, in Malta. And the second band, uh, throws off a signal of 18 hertz to that stone, to that stone, to that stone, creating a web of matrix energy on the inside of a stone circle. And if you have a, a central stone that you get at lots of ancient sites, that beams across the land, yeah, and carries a signal way, way off in the distance, okay, connecting ancient sites not just through ley lines, but through megalithic energy that travels along the lay. Because it's an incredible thing that there's no difference between a semiconductor um, made in Silicon Valley, in, in California, uh, that, that is, isn't it, to the inside of a standing stone. There's hardly any difference, okay? They are designed to transmit energy, yeah? It, they convert it from earth energy to aerial energy, and you can feel that aerial energy. And at this moment in time, at stone circles, we are starting to pick up man-made signals coming out of those energy bands. And this is before we all switch on to 5 rotten G, yeah? <laughs> So we have to take responsibility for our ancient sites with 5G, yeah? And if it gets switched on in the Avery and Stonehenge environs, there is a now a very growing protest with the Druids. And you've got some very uh, powerful uh, Druids, and they call themselves warriors, and they really are. They are warrior types. So I feel Stonehenge and Avery will be safe. So that's... We've kind of seen there's underground yin water, there's uh, yang water, there's earth currents that entwine ley lines. The stones rooted into them start transmitting megalithic energy at a, maybe a sound frequency the ancients could attune to. Well, there's more to standing stones than that. We live uh, on Gaia, and Gaia is magnetic, and she has magnetic poles, doesn't she, to the north and to the south. And if we imagine that stones are so sensitive in their crystal lattice structure that they can sense the magnetic field, yeah? You can as well, actually. So, uh, so that isn't you know, too much of a surprise. But what standing stones do to that energy is they... If you see the ones that say positive here, yeah, they're aligned north, south, east, and west. And then you see it in its negative phase here, going at an angle. Can you see what I mean? And you've got a stone there. The height of the stone dictates the width here. Yeah, and these are called cardinal rays. Yeah. Now, cardinal rays are very, very powerful. And I say to people that come out to ancient sites with me, walk around the stone and tell me where you think that you feel the energy really, really strongly within one's body. And they tend to stop at the same place and go, oh, I think it's about here. And kids, they spin around about 10 times and then just jump up and say, here it is, like this. And it's always on these positive bands here. And that will, again, increase your energy levels. Yeah, so I think part of the decodement of a stone circle is you put certain stones in certain positions and you can work with their energies, okay? And you can get them to energize your body or take things away as well. And we'll be looking at taking away uh, energies later on in this presentation. So standing stones are really set in the magnetic field and earth energy, producing these amazing arrays of energy. And like I say, if you've got enough uh, sensitive equipment, you can record this. But again, what's happening now? In England, we have a phrase, and in Europe, we call it e-smog. I don't know if that's your phrase here for lots of electromagnetic energies that are in poor here, e-smog. Yeah, everything. I'm surrounded by e-smog now. And, uh, and to, a, to a certain degree, the, the stones, again, are absorbing a lot of e-smog. So when I take people to ancient sites, I really like it when they don't see the site through their mobile phone. 
yeah, and just actually interact with the energy. You can take photographs afterwards, but let's not see these sites through, uh, through our mobile phones. Now, in Dowson terms, you have two very powerful grid systems called the Hartman grid and the Curry nets. And I'm sure some of us that are into geopathic stress and things have heard about the Hartman grid, yep? Anyone heard of the Hartman grid? A few. Uh, heard of the curry net? A few have heard about the curry net. We need to know about the curry net. Gaia has different types of energies. I do. I eat food, I have to do a deposit of it. I shan't go into details, but you get the picture. Yeah? Gaia will have to do the same thing. She has to absorb energy, but push some out. Yeah? Because she's a living being, being. She's, a, she's this amazing woman going around in, in space. So she has to have that. And that has to have, it's called the curry net. Yeah, it's a way of releasing energy. And I mentioned earlier that Dr. Kathy Batchelor, in the 80s through to the 90s, researched 11,000 homes and found that it doesn't matter what therapy you have to heal your complaint, you could go down the holistic route. I'm going to have acupuncture, reflexology, Reiki. You could have that. Or you could say, well, I'm going to go down the orthodox route. I'm going to have RT, a radiotherapy, we call that in England, or chemotherapy. You could go down that route. Yeah? But if you're above the curry net, it was found through stringent research with doctors that if you went back to your bed position or if you work at home and you're self-employed, you know, where you sit and do the computer a lot, then you don't self-heal. Yeah? Because the geopathic stress coming out of the, the curry net does two things. It thickens your blood, for example, so you're more prone to blood clots and heart attacks. And also, your cells in your body have an electrical charge, a positive and a negative, and it slows down that charge. More than that, what geopathic stress does is your intestines do a really good job. They eat the food and then they release all the minerals from that food. Well, that's not if you're eating GMs, of course, <laughs> and then you're building up toxins. But generally speaking, in good fresh food, your body's doing that, not with geopathic stress. It slows everything down so you come susceptible to what's in your DNA. Okay? More than that, what they discovered in Germany was, and this is a staggering, accurate statistic that should shock us, a third of all hospital admissions in two counties, that's like a, um, a province within a state, I suppose, when we look at the United States, were in hospital because of geopathic stress, a third, yeah? So if you take a third of all people out of all of the hospitals across the world, you, you have an effective health service system. So this is what these doctors were doing. They were looking at these grid systems and advising people not to live above them because there are power places on Gaia that you shouldn't. And when we look at the Hartman grid, for example, it's about two and a half meters across. That's this square one over, over here. This is the Hartman grid. And this is the curry net. And they follow particular directions. This line's north-south, east-west, and this northeast, like this. And you see the energy coming up out of Gaia, rising up like walls in this room. Yeah? And if you can douse, and it's really easy to douse for the curry net, and I'll be doing this in a, a workshop, you can find it within seconds. It's not, it's not difficult to do. It's that powerful, you can feel this energetic force. And this is what uh, Dr. Kathy Batchelor was looking for. You don't have anything above these points. Can you see what I mean? You go in that point. Now, say you've got your router there, or your router, I think you pronounce it over here. Tomato, tomato, uh, water, water. Um, <laughs> uh, you have these sort of like, you know, lines coming down here. You can't have any electrical device on that system. Yeah? So you, you have to start moving things around because it's designed to flow an electromagnetic current. Research done across Europe showed that it was flowing with a really, really strong electromagnetic current. And your body will start to absorb that geopathic stress. Yeah? 
So with all of this knowledge coming out of Europe and elsewhere, it gives us the empowerment to look after our families, look after our loved ones. And anyone in this audience, if you hear a young mum say this, my baby won't stop crying. No matter what I do, the baby won't stop crying. Just say a few words. Move the cot. Yeah? Move the cot. And they go, well, what do you mean, move the cot? Move it, maybe by a metre, two metres, and just see. And then before you know it, they say, the baby's quiet. Yeah? It's, everything's changed. Now, depending where you are, say you're on the, having the geopathic stress on this grid system and your head's on it, well, that's going to get affected. If your knees are on it, it's going to get affected. It's where you are in, uh, on your body on the grid system, if you see what I mean. But your body is an amazing thing. Some people will react to geopathic stress by saying, oh, I woke up in a really strange position, you know, with their stomach away. You're moving away from the grid line naturally. Your body knows to a certain degree what's good and bad for him. The other strong sign of geopathic stress is teeth grinding, not being able to go to sleep properly, waking up feeling fatigued, having aching limbs. They're all the signs of geopathic stress. And like I say, in Europe, you can get a blood test for this and a certificate for your home saying it's geopathic stress free. And a wonderful friend of uh, mine called uh, Michelle Hood, she she makes some very good devices in organ of pyramids that can diffuse these type of energies. So you can diffuse your home, but you've got to get off the grid, yeah? And like I say, this is before 5G is in our wake, yeah? And it will electrify uh, the grid. So how do you find a grid, yeah? How do you find a grid? Really, really easy. All grid lines on the curry net come in northeast, southwest, southeast, northwest. Yep. So you just take a compass reading, and I'll be doing this in the workshop. You take a compass reading, point it to northeast or north, and then walk across that way with your dowsing rod. And when it goes found, massive reaction, that's the curry net. Okay? And then once you realize, how does the curry net make me feel? And you stand on it for a little while, you'll think, oh, oh, I got an ache here, I feel this, and it's called a geopathic stress signature. So you learn about how the different earth energies affect your body, and in ancient China, they would walk the nine walks, and that means you go around somebody's house, walk around it, and you, you find out how the energies make you feel, and you can decode the house that way. So we can really, again, see earth energies as living in harmony with Gaia or not. Yeah, so I think it's one of the fundamental things that should be taught in schools, yeah? Find the curry net and get yourself off the net and then you will be healthy, wealthy and wise, literally, children in schools. Yep. It was found in Germany through the studies that you've only got to put a kid on the crossing point of that grid system, slows their learning down, makes them disruptive. So move the desk. You've got to discover, oh, he's not listening in class, he won't do this, he won't do that, or she won't, shouldn't have said he, that's a bit sexist. <laughs> uh, she or he uh, uh, said that, then move the desk, yeah? And I've been working with some uh, nurses from Minnesota for some years, and we've aligned a ward avoiding the grid system, yeah? So you can self-heal, because if you're in hospital and you're on the grid line, yeah? You're not going to self-heal. It's a pointless exercise in, uh, in healing. So I, for me, these energies represent how we can grow strong together. Yeah? And the sin of what happened in the Victorian period, that's about a couple hundred years ago, when we had Queen Victoria on the throne, the, the secret societies, such as the Masons, and you know, you know the sort of thing, you know, those uh, people that rule behind the scenes, they were looking for really negative grid systems, and there's two or three more besides this one, but this is the one that's the most powerful for your daily needs. And they were putting orphanages on them, prisons. Yeah? So not only are you placing people that are in vulnerable positions, especially in ancient Victorian England, they were undereducated, and there's a lot of things going on, 
placed the prisons on them. Wormwood Scrubs, it's on one of these negative grid systems, and they have the worst riots there. You know, it's, uh, so they have been abused. The knowledge, uh, you know, of these systems is, uh, is a shocking truth and a, a shocking reality. We have to make these changes. So when we come to the heel stone, the heel stone is an outlier to Stonehenge. There's part of uh, Stonehenge there. There's the heel stone there. Today, has anyone been to the heel stone? Yay, so you do travel, it's always good. Hey, yeah, you've been there as well, fantastic. Well, we see it like that today, but that's not how our ancestors wanted us to interact with the heel stone. As you can see here, they put a massive ditch around it. Can you see? With chalk, you couldn't go near that stone because it's a really powerfully charged stone that's in the northeast. Yeah? The northeast is where the midsummer sunrise comes up and the moon at its mid swing position, and it's on the curry net. Yeah? So these stones, I feel our ancient ancestors, could convert the curry net into something positive or at least generate an electrical current. So they're activated at certain times of the year, these uh, grid systems as well. So, so these ancient people, they knew what they were doing. Yeah? They knew that if they put a stone in this position, that position, they could change the consciousness, the health, uh, the frequencies of, uh, of the landscape, and the fertility of the land as well. So in my opinion, when people say to me, you know, oh, they, uh, you, are you going to the summer solstice, Maria, to Stonehenge to see the sunrise? That's what it's all about, isn't it? It was an astronomical calendar, yeah. So the ancients did that for pretty sunrise, yeah? You could see a sunrise anywhere. They were putting these stones facing those solar directions because they have power. Yeah, so the, the crossing points have uh, influences like cell enlargement, cancer tune, tune, uh, uh, tumors, the discharging, that's the negative ones, will give you inflammation, and then your body reacts. Remember I said the energies of stones grow inside you? Gaia is interacting with your energies through your solar plexus chakra, and if you can measure in dowsing from here, you can tell if somebody's got cancer because they will have a, a meter over in this way. So you can start to predict things uh, with, with dowsing uh, as well. So it's a really handy thing to have. And this is the currents I was talking about to you earlier. You have the ley line. Can you see it? The St. Michael ley and the currents entwine in it. Yep, yeah, that's a ley system. That's the power in the land. Can you see them? Male and female entwining across the landscape like that. So when you enter an ancient site, the ancestors probably went in on the energies they needed. Do I need female energies or solar energies. Then we have another type of energy called a genesis line. It's a hermaphrodite line, and it's born of a male and female uh, vortex. So you've got a male and a female, and those energies go way, way down as one. And some landscapes are created by that uh, sign, and ancient sites put on them. This is a long lost site of yours. These were mounds in Ohio, and this kind of serpentine creature, which I think was set on a genesis line, was two miles long in Ohio. Uh, so you had some amazing, amazing sights. But what is Earth energy? Now, this was using what's called the old field filter with someone dousing with me at Wayland Smithy, and it comes up out of the ground rises above you, engulfs you, if you will, and it's said to be born of 12 colors, okay? And these 12 colors are said to be very sacred. So imagine these colors coming out of the ground when you're walking through Stonehenge, you're walking through a rainbow wonderland, and at the same time, the sun is beaming down some colors as well. And when the two connect, you have harmony with Gaia and the sun, okay? And that's when things really, really do become very, very uh, powerful. 
Now, when we look at the French research into dowsin over here, here you have the sun, yeah? And the sun gives off light through a prism, doesn't it? So if you put a prism up to the sun, you'd see the colors of the rainbow, wouldn't you? And that's what creates a rainbow, uh, it's the light uh, prism. But to the French diviners, there was much more to lays and earth energy than that. There were hidden frequencies called the negative green, infrared and ultraviolet and ultra white and ultra black, okay? Now the sun beams down its rays. And this is us in the day here, but Australia or elsewhere is in the night, isn't it? Today. So sometimes Gaia is in day and sometimes Gaia is in night. And when those sunbeams go through the shadow of the night, they come back up and have the negative green. And that's the most powerful form of Earth energy ever in the landscape. Yeah? And it's really, really powerful. And the last person to have investigated the negative green was Himmler and Hitler. Yeah? And that's a shocking testament to where we have gone with Earth energy. And in my father's collection, I have a wonderful photograph of Hitler shaking Himmler's hand, saying, congratulations on your Dowson Academy. And they claimed there was 15 points of the negative green on Earth, and the most, one of the most powerful was Antarctica, for example. So we can join a few dots. Now, physically, what's happening with the sun at dawn, it gives off long waves of the red ray. Yeah, any physicist would tell you that, and it's a long wave like that. Yeah, and so that's what's happening. But at the same time, in esoteric Down symptoms, you have a short wave of ultraviolet coming out at dawn. So you have physically a long wave, the red wave, and then metaphysically a short wave, violet is important. The physical, uh, the top uh, base chakra rather, and the, the top chakra.